Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to studio audience and our viewers out on the web. Welcome to Bay to Bay TV. This show tonight will be a fabulous show with two of my most favorite speakers. Our first speaker this evening works on online marketing with Adobe Systems. Have you ever wondered if you've ever made an impact on someone in the past? Well, our next speaker, Kevin Ferguson, will tell us all about how to leverage social media. His entitled speech is Looking Forward to the Hiccups. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kevin Ferguson. Thank you. <laughs> Do you ever get the hiccups? They say when you get the hiccups, it's because somebody you know is talking about you. And the way to get rid of the hiccups is to guess who that is. I could never guess who's talking about me until recently, thanks to Facebook. To my surprise, I just realized that Facebook has been bridging eras of my life. And if you're one of the millions of people on Facebook, I bet it's bridging the eras of your life too. You may just not have thought about it. Now when you start out on Facebook, many people, as, mi as many of you know, you start out keeping tabs on your closest friends. And then you expand your circle to your recently met acquaintances. And then something really annoying happens. Facebook suggests I should be friends with Jenkins. I couldn't stand Jenkins in high school. And I'm sure he didn't like me either. But what's happening here is that Jenkins is not actually giving me the hiccups, not just yet. But Facebook's degrees of separation algorithm is saying, because you're friends with these two people, you probably know Jenkins. Well, yeah, I know Jenkins. That's why I'm not friends with him. <laughs> but what is cool about Facebook is that it makes it far easier to reach out to somebody you are friends with as you think of them or as you talk about them with mutual friends. Oh, oh wow. That's Speedy Travis. Travis Bench, it was more than 10 years ago. I hadn't thought about him. He was, in our li he was in my life many, many years ago. And I got a Facebook message from him, just out of the blue. And it said, hey, coach, remember me? I was on your seventh ranked basketball team. You taught me how to play defense like T.R. Dunn. I was like, oh my god. I haven't thought about this occurrence in more than 20 years let alone T.R. Dunn. T.R. Dunn was a very obscure NBA player back in the 80s, played for the Denver Nuggets, and he was a defensive specialist. Rarely scored, so most people never really heard of him. Well, I had read an article in Sports Fitness Magazine when I was coaching this basketball team about how he had kept Michael Jordan, when, he, when Jordan was scoring 40 points a game, T.R. Dunn held him to seven points. And it had his workout regimen in the magazine. So I came to practice one day, and I said, line up, kids. We're going to do defensive drills like T.R. Dunn. And they all went, who? I said, I looked over at one of my guards who was wearing a Michael Jordan jersey. I said, the guy who shut down your idol. I couldn't believe that Travis remembered that from 20 years ago. It was very touching. Oh, wow. Kathy Rain just Facebooked me. Kathy was somebody I met right around the same time that I got that Facebook message from Travis about a year ago. And we were working in a, in a uh, training program together. And we were carpooling to a sp specific event. And that's when we discovered that we both lived in Belmont 20 years ago, three blocks away. And she said, you know, I, use, I have a son who's just about your age. I said, well, I went to Cipriani Elementary School. And she goes, so did my son, PJ. I was, oh my god. I used to play basketball with PJ every day. In fact, PJ's stepdad, Michael Rain, used to coach us on the, on the uh, blacktop almost every day. Well, fast forward six months later, 
I get another Facebook message from 3,000 miles away on a beach on Maui. It's Travis Bench, where he works at Whole Foods. And he says, hey, coach, you'll never believe who just came through my store at my, at my line. Your old basketball coach, Michael Rain. Like, oh my god. Now, I wasn't shocked that Michael Rain and Kathy were in Maui because I knew they had a condo there. But I knew that they didn't know, they didn't know Travis. And so what was shocking to me that those two or three minutes while they checked out at the grocery store, they started talking about me. That was surprising. And so what actually happened is they discovered that they both lived in Belmont many years ago. And so Michael Rain said, well, maybe you know my, you're almost my stepson's age. Maybe you know him, PJ? And Travis said, no. Nope. He goes, how about Kevin Ferguson? Kevin Ferguson? Oh my god, he was my basketball coach. He taught me how to play relentless defense. And Michael Rain went, huh, that's funny. I taught Kevin how to play relentless defense. <laughs> now, without Facebook, the chances of me ever finding out that this conversation ever took place is slim to none. As if Travis is going to look up my phone number and call me about this conversation. There's no way that was going to happen. But because of Facebook, this dialogue takes place a lot more than you think. And it's a lot of fun. And you don't have to get the hiccups to discover that people are talking about you. Do you engage on Facebook? Who's talking about you? Thank you. Kevin, what a terrific speech. You got to tell me the truth now. What's that? Are you a shill for, for a Facebook? A shell? Yeah, I mean, do you have pre-IPO shares? Well, actually, I am Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie through your teeth. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, <laughs> off camera, you told me that you're going to Hawaii. I am. I am going to be running the Kona Half Marathon. Half Marathon? Half Marathon. Why not a full marathon? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Because you said that, I'll do it. Terrific. So I know you're doing this for a great cause. Yeah, it's for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, raising it, money for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. So Crohn's and Colitis, is that a digestive disorder? It is a digestive disorder. What does that do? Is it, how did you get involved with this? Uh, well, they were promoting it at my company at Adobe, and I know, a couple of, I know quite a few people who are suffering from this disease, and I thought it would be a great opportunity to um, raise awareness and raise, um, raise funds for those who are suffering from it, and hopefully we can find a cure. Well, that's terrific. You know, honestly, that's a foundation very close to my heart. I have a loved one that suffers from uh, colitis, and I know how difficult that could be. What was the biggest challenge preparing for this test, for this half marathon? Now a full marathon. <laughs> uh, well, it was about 20 years ago. I used to run in, in high school, and I had not run more than three miles in probably 10, 15 years. And well, now you're going to have a chance. I thought, well, I have, about a week ago, I ran seven miles. So well, great. That's... I wish you the best. <laughs> Send me that donation card. All right. Definitely All right. will. Thanks, Thank Kevin. You. Great speech. Thank you. Evaluating Kevin's speech is Wei Shelley Sir Kay from Cupertino Toastmasters. Welcome, Wei Shelley. Thank you, Ben. Hello, fellow Toastmasters, and most especially Kevin. Thank you for that wonderful speech about less about the pitfalls and perils of Facebook and more about how Facebook can help bring the world closer together. Kevin was giving a speech from the Speaking to Inform manual. And in that manual, his job is to inform us about something, motivate us to take action, and at the end, give us some sort of call to action. And Kevin, I think you did that really well. I wasn't sure at first what, where his speech was going by the title from, uh, about the hiccups. But as he went on, he took all of us on a trip down Kevin's personal memory lane. And he used the stories in his speech very effectively to illustrate points. Yes, there is the perils of Facebook, where these random people that you didn't get along with in high school want to friend you. But then there's the wonderful heartwarming stuff about your, like your story with T.R. Dunn and how people from your elementary school were talking about you in Hawaii. 
So I thought that your speech was crafted really well. The other thing that I felt that Kevin did really well is that he used a hook, the hiccuping and the checking of the phone. He did this repeatedly. And when you do that, you grab our attention by these physical gestures. And that was another way that I thought you made your speech not only entertaining, but it really grabbed us and it helped us connect with you. In the future, Kevin, I would suggest that you use the stage more, more the breadth of the stage. Because your speech is a very active speech. There's a lot of action happening. Yes, there's the action on your phone, but then there's the basketball, there's the Hawaii, and there's thinking about all these people that you'd grown up with. And it would be nice to see you be more active on the stage itself. I noticed in the beginning, you were mostly in one spot. And then as the speech warmed up, I could tell that you yourself warmed up and you really got into it. And you started moving around more. And that made us more interesting to follow along with you. Other than that, though, I thought that you did a fantastic job. Kevin is a seasoned Toastmaster, and it shows. You had excellent vocal variety. Your hand gestures and your body language, for the most part, underscored your speech and did not distract or detract from your message. And I like that you had a call to action at the end. There are some people, like us, who are a little bit wary about Facebook. But after hearing your speech, I think I will be a little bit more proactive on Facebook. Thank you, Kevin. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Wayne Thank you. Wonderfully done. Thank you. Every month, Beta Bay sends out a roving video crew. And they visit Toastmasters clubs all around the Bay Area. If you'd like your club to be visited by a crew, make sure you contact Beta Bay TV. This next segment was filmed at SAP Toastmasters. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, my name is Elizabeth. I've been a Toastmaster for a year and a half. A good uh, colleague and friend of mine introduced me to it um, at, at a time I was transitioning roles and I thought it was a great opportunity to meet new colleagues and practice speaking in public to prepare for maybe interviews and other opportunities. Since then, I've actually recently accepted a role uh, training speakers for a large event our company is organizing. So, in my day job, I spend a lot of time doing presentations and, and doing, doing running meetings and, and speaking with people and working with my colleagues. The challenge with, with that is that I work with a very distributed team, so most of the calls and most of the presentations that I do are either by a web conference or by just plain old television. Toastmatches has given me, it's given me the opportunity to speak more face to face with people and do presentations on a, on a weekly basis. Hi, my name is Cyril Shakeri and I've joined SAP's Toastmaster Club a few months ago, so I'm, I'm relatively new. Uh, this is a kind of skill that I uh, felt that I need to improve on, uh, public speaking, giving presentations, uh, and uh, the format that Toastmaster has. It's, it's perfect for, for improving this skill. Hi, my name is Heather Cowan, and I've been a part of the SAP Toastmasters group for about two years now, and it's been a fabulous experience. I have gained confidence speaking in front of colleagues and friends and strangers, and I've improved my um, extemporaneous, so impromptu speaking skills, as well as I've um, improved giving presentations, and. I have, uh, you know, gotten more confident with actually, you know, having good eye contact with people when I speak. Hi, my name is Ella Margulis, and I joined the I joined the Toastmasters Club back a few months ago. I was very busy with school and work at that time, and I wasn't really focusing on preparing my speeches. So up to now, I haven't done any structured speech as yet. But the good thing about this club is that you have flexibility. You can really do things that you're comfortable with. And, uh, you get the benefit of a very nurturing environment where everybody is supportive and forgiving of any mistakes you make in your speeches. I encourage all of you to uh, join the Toastmasters club near you, if not SAP Toastmasters, because as you can see by this wonderful banner here, it's one of the best and most distinguished clubs in the area. A very 
polished speaker. I've seen him perform in several times, and tonight he will be presenting his speech on how to be an expert. Actually, what kind of expert would you want to be? The title of his speech, and he's working on the ninth manual speech from our Toastmaster manual, is Dear Expert, please welcome Roy Terry. Hi, Thanks, Roy. Ben. Yeah. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever just wanted to get away? Maybe you were telling a sort of saucy joke at work and the boss was walking up right behind you. Or maybe you, you uh, had a very, very likable young salesman come to your door and you invited them in before you knew what the product really was. Well, it happened to me at dinner. No, it wasn't a date. It was a professional consultation. Her name was Maggie, and she was an expert. Has it ever happened to you that you met with someone who had a lot more experience than you did? Maybe a lot more confidence, a lot more knowledge? Well, that person for me was Maggie. And she was out to set me straight. Now, the restaurant was really delightful. The wine was delicious. But right around the entrees, Maggie got, looked at me with a kind of a tilted smile. And she said, Roy, I don't think I recall your topic. Roy, what is your area of expertise? And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the beginning of my dinner from hell. Think of it. Right there on the plate next to the Alfredo were Roy's bright and shiny dreams. Would they be judged worthy? Or would they be sent back like lumpy sauce? I really wanted to reply and be sprightly, but my throat <coughs> felt a little tight. And I think there was a sheen of perspiration across my forehead. Because after all, Maggie had a PhD. She had been speaking for 10 years in her area of expertise. What could I say that wouldn't sound foolish, naive, lame? And I want you to freeze this moment, the expert and the beginner, so we can notice that all of us play both roles. And the question for tonight is, what sort of expert do you want to be? Because there are three basic kinds. There is the hard-boiled expert, our Maggie. She will set you straight. She will disabuse you of your uh, false assumptions. She will give you a new plan, and she will help you get on a schedule, and it will be all for your own good. Second kind of expert is the polite expert. And we all become the polite expert sometimes because, after all, in many social situations, it's the best we can do. And in Toastmasters, for example, if Kevin had made a speech and I was talking to Kevin, I would just say, well, Kevin, that was a great speech. I loved your speech. And you know that five-and-a-half-minute segment? You know that five-and-a-half minutes about the elephant and the one-legged dwarf? You could just shorten that a little bit, but great job. So this is the polite expert. And there's a third kind of expert that is really the most valuable kind that we can be more often. And that is the loving expert. And the loving expert is not about hugs and kisses. And the loving expert is just as much an expert as Maggie. But the loving expert does something more. They look inside you. They sense what you need. They pay attention to what you're asking for. I got my first loving advice when I was 12 years old. My uncle, Dick, visited from out of town. And at one point, we were riding in the car together. And I need to tell you that I am the youngest of six kids. So as I grew up, I had eight experts all around me. Everyone in the house was an expert except Roy. Well, there in the car, Uncle Dick suddenly turned to me and said, you know, Roy, I don't think you need to do all these things your brothers are doing. I think you should just do what you want to do in your own life. <sighs> well, my jaw dropped because no one had ever said anything that thoughtful to me before. It's 46 years later, and I still remember that 10 seconds because the truth is loving experts change people's lives. So think about what kind of expert you want to be. And so I found myself still at the dinner table with Maggie wondering what to do. And to be honest, I didn't have an area of expertise. I really wasn't sure. But I had some enthusiasm, so I just launched into the topic. And I said, Maggie, I have been reading so much about Hollywood and the way movies are made, the collaboration between all the artistic factors, the logistics, and the technology coming together to make an amazing product. And then I sort of lost my breath because I could see the expression on Maggie's face. I could see that this wasn't going to fly. She looked at me like I had killed a cat. Hollywood, she said. Hollywood? I roll my eyes. Roy, we have a problem, said Maggie. And indeed we did. I felt it. I felt my body tighten up. And my vision got sort of funny. It seemed I could only really see the center of the table. But Maggie, our hard-boiled expert, was going strong. 
she called for the pads and the pens, and we worked, and we redid what my topic should be, how I should be a speaker, who should my clients be. It was something to do with technical communications, as I recall. What would be my plan of development? What would be my first step? And who would I market to? All in 45 minutes. And I still remember walking out of that dinner with all my notes, and Maggie turning cheerfully to me and waving goodbye, saying, Roy, send me an email. Let me know how you're progressing. I want to keep in touch. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was an email I never sent. And those notes, they just flew away. Because no matter what you want to do, if you want to skateboard down Pi Pikes Peak and write a book, if you want to buy yaks and start a uh, cheese business, do it. Whatever you have the passion for, whatever you have the vision for, wherever you see yourselves in the future is way more real than all of the knowledge Maggie will have. No matter how clever, no matter how perceptive she is, the real part is in here. And so this is my final request. Dear expert, please see me. Please notice me. Please help me do what I need to do. Because if you want to fix me, I just need to get away. And by the way, Maggie, if you're out there, thank you so much for all the great advice and information. And next time, it would be wonderful if you bought me dinner. Thank you, Roy. Sure. What an entertaining speech. Thank you. What kind of expert do you want to be? Well, the loving expert is the best expert to be, but it's challenging. How so? It's challenging because <clears throat> we do sometimes, we like to think quickly. And when you meet a person, say in a Toastmaster club or any kind of environment, and you think they're making a mistake, well, the natural tendency is just to say, well, I think you should just do it this way. That would be smart. But there may be all kinds of reasons why they're doing it the way they are. So we need to listen first. You know, in your bio, you had some very interesting things. I got to believe that some of those some of those trips that you've taken, I understand you hitchhiked across the United States I two did. times. Yes. Did you do one on a motorcycle? I have traveled across the country on a motorcycle as well. As you know, I'm a incredible motorcycle enthusiast. I found that very interesting. Yeah. What was the impetus for hitchhiking across the United States? Well, it's a very inexpensive way to travel. There you go. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> I wanted to be a writer. So I, I went to New York and I, I went on a motorcycle. And then when I needed to take a break, I hitchhiked back home to Idaho. And then I hitchhiked back to New York. Boise to yes. New York. Boise to New York. In fact, by way of Florida on the way back. So have you managed to fulfill that goal of being a writer? Not yet, but there's time. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> so what is your next goal? My next goal is to uh, develop a book proposal. Oh, that's This great. is something that I need to do badly because I have so much um, material. Terrific. Well, I wish you the best of luck. I can't wait to see you at the next Thank you. Toast Will Master. you help me on this book proposal? I'd be happy to. Awesome. <laughs> I'm terrific. an expert. Awesome. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roy. Mm -hmm. Our evaluator, evaluating Roy's speech, is Harsha Vyas. Please welcome Harsha. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Toastmasters, and especially Roy. My goodness, you came here with a bang, and we were all awake listening to you. You caught our attention. The loving expert. I love that phrase that you used. I like the way you build the entire story around how you got, got about getting the expert advice. And you talk, you laid out the stage, you laid out the characters, the food as well. My goodness, Alfredo sauce. Yeah, it looks pretty cool, pretty cool. I'm ready to eat that too. I like the, the I, what you did was you talked about what you wanted to do. You yourself, from Maggie's uh, question, you were taken back. And you kind of laid out your expression, the, the visual, the wor picture words you used were, were very, very effective. So we could visualize you, my goodness, what am I going to do? Where did Hollywood come from? I have no idea. There was no sense. And Maggie thought the same. And yet she worked with you. So you were telling us your feelings, the reactions you were getting from Maggie. That was all very well laid out. And we could really hear you and understand what you were going through. The whole irony of that was that towards the end, when she said goodbye and bye, when it comes to reality, you didn't do, I mean, you didn't take her advice and send her the email. However, you turned out to be, you did what you did and relate the story back 
to your uncle who kind of advised you to do what you want to do. And uh, so that was a good wrap of the story. One thing I found was that an area that I would like to see is that you, you were running a fast train there. And I think it would have been help if you just paused a little bit at some point, especially when you were thinking that the email. Why didn't you? You know, the question was, why didn't you? So some pauses would have added some, some thinking or some mystery around the story as to how it had ended up. So apart from that, I think the, you know, the structure of the thing, the, the, um, the speech was good. You had the beginning, ending, and a call to action. You had a call to action for everybody to say, hey, no matter what advice anybody can give you, it's all up to you as an individual to get to where you want to be. And so that was a good message. Right, Madam, start first question. Thank you. Wow. Did tonight's show look easy? Well, I got to tell you, it's easy when you're a host for a show when the average length of time that these speakers have been at Toastmasters has been 10 years. If you would like to appear on Bay to Bay TV, go to the website. Go to d4tm.org. Look for Bay to Bay TV in the bottom corner, and you could contact the producers to get on this show. I think this is one of the greatest resources that we have in District 4. Where else can we, as Toastmasters, come to a real live TV studio with three cameras, a producer, and be able to use this resource to be better speakers? I encourage each and every one of you, if you have a desire to be a better speaker, to come to Bay TV. Before we close tonight's show, I'd really like to commend and congratulate this year's winners of the District 4 contest in both the International Speech Contest and to Table Topics. Congratulations to Nancy Coulter and to Scott Guerin. Thank you. Good night.